You ever ask yourself why? Why do we go deep? Why do we need to linger in emotion? What is the point of that? I had a trainee ask me that one time. I had a training. She's like, I got to rejection. Why do I keep needing to stay here? Let's talk about that today. Welcome to the Leading Edge in Emotionally Focused Therapy with your hosts, Dr. James Hawkins and Dr. Ryan Reyna. EFT is a dynamic model that humbles even the most seasoned therapists. Together, we want to come alongside you as you continually push the leading edge of your understanding and application of this wonderful model developed by Dr. Sue Johnson. Yeah, good to be back with you here. Good to be back with you here. We're excited to uh, share uh, three or four episodes here pretty quickly. And um, I, I, I like this topic, James, because I think it's an important balance. If you look at our show, 40-something episodes at this point, we're probably a little out of balance towards working with protection, you mm. know, in the, in the tactical ways to be with people when you get blocked, et cetera. We do that. I won't apologize too much for that. We do that because that is where most participants live clinically. That's where most of our listeners, that's where most EFTers, especially folks who are learning the model, they work with almost nothing but protection. That's why we do that. And yet it's really, really important we talk about the other side, which is staying with the motion longer, going deeper and so forth. So I'm glad to be sharing this today. Yeah. And specifically uh, what we're talking about is camping out near fear and pain. And I, you know, Ryan and I like to work with images. And so the image I even, when I picture this camping out, is literally, you know what, finding a spot and saying, you know what, we're on this journey, but we got to set up a tent here. And this is a place we need to stay. We need to, we need to stay. We need to set up a fire, get the food out, get the can of beans, some hot dogs. This is a place we need to sit down and have a talk. We need to have a a moment to think and reflect and to rest. Um, and particularly when we think about that with fear and pain, you, and I love that that's that, that uh, trainee asked that question, right? It's, it's a good question. Why do it? Um, we need to be able to give our clients a reason why, but you know who else we need to give a, right, a reason why to? The, the body of the therapist too, because your body's going to be like, ooh, this feels uncomfortable. Why are we doing this? And here's why, at least in my mind. When we think about attachment, you know, um, attachment is activated around fear and pain. So we need to be able to camp out, to stay with it, to properly understand it, to experience it with our clients, to get a sense of what their world looks like when their fear and pain comes alive. We don't need to touch it and move away from it. We need to learn to live in one. We're doing therapy, you know, um, by what we're also doing with when we sit with their fear and their pain. We're allowing it to come alive. We're allowing their body to have a different limbic experience of it, to build some tolerance around it and camping out around it with them to understand it, to help them have new behavioral moves with it. This is where change happens. When we can camp out and get the essence of it, when we can see it, we can feel it with them. Um, you, you know, Ryan said there's a couple episodes coming out. The next one comes out is going to be an interview with Catherine Ring that actually kind of builds upon this. So this is great that we're talking about this. The necessity of why would we do this moment is so huge because, once again, let me be clear, attachment is activated around fear and pain. Attachment comes online when there's fear and pain. What it's trying to do is make the person move towards a safe, trusted other to get some form of comfort or proximity. But what's happened, our clients who are stuck in clinical distress, when their fear and pain comes alive, they get stuck in secondary behaviors that don't allow them to, one, experience it, feel safe with it, or move to go get comfort or support around it. So what we're doing as therapists is we're building up that tolerance to stay there to help them have new kind of these titrated, deeper experiences around corrective emotional experience around fear and pain. So that's my way of trying to frame why are we doing this? That's good. It gives me a metaphor. It's a shocker, right? <laughs> I go for it. All right. Um, it's a long story. I'll make it really fast. I was uh, I played American football in high school. Uh, my senior year, I was uh, things were going really well, being recruited and so forth by lots of people, and I had a freak accident. Um, I was tackled, and I uh, fell on my left shoulder, and my collarbone broke into 17 pieces. So that was bad. Uh, so they're like, you're done for the season. But I didn't want to be done, so I played three weeks later. 
probably shouldn't have, but they made a, um, my doctor made this um, plaster of Paris kind of thing that mm-hmm. went right over that break with a big dome in it. So the contact couldn't actually hit that point. And I think that's a pretty good metaphor for how our clients live their lives. They got this really vulnerable sore spot and the more lack of safety and reactivity there is, they just build pads around it. And so as a therapist, we need that again. That is, that is the, our, our biggest sort of clue towards what the actual need is and what the corrective experience needs to be. And so I think it's easy as a clinician to make, to make one of two mistakes. One is just go right in and try to remove all the pads. Just go for deep primary emotion, longings, needs, how much you miss each other when that's really premature and misattuned. I think sometimes EFT might have inadvertently been taught in a way that that's what you should do. Just go deeper all the time. That's, that's misattuned. But it's also e- equally misattuned to, to stay cognitive, to continue doing too much cycle work. And, and anything that moves you out of proximity to that attachment pain, mm-hmm. those are the two mistakes we want to stay away from. It's funny that we're having this conversation. Excuse me. I uh, just finished a slide that I'm going to do a training with tomorrow talking about my own live demonstrations at trainings. If, you, if, you're not, if you've not been to EFT trainings first, we'd love to invite you. Mm-hmm. Check them out on ISF.com. Um, and uh, do an externship. I was, uh, whether in person or ISEF is rolling out some new online ones, so if you can't travel for some reason, that's a great alternative. Absolutely. Externship uh, changed my life for the better, uh, personally and professionally, so I'd love to, we'd love to have you at a training. But anyway, one of the things that's unique about EFT training is we're just not, we don't just talk theory. We don't, we don't you know, death by PowerPoint sort of thing. We're going to teach some, the concepts for sure, but at every externship and some core skills, there's at least one live demonstration where the trainer gets a local, a local couple usually from a community and works with them in front of the group. And that's a great learning experience for one thing. But, you know, I had a significant shift that happened in my, in my ability to do lives about four or five years ago. I don't know exactly when. And I didn't even, didn't even necessarily know I was doing it. I just got a little more clear in a few of these focus concepts, which is part of what inspires what we're doing. Mm-hmm. And my lives went to a whole new level when I stopped pushing for depth of emotion, which seems counterintuitive. Mm-hmm. But you can put yourself in the, in the role of a trainer doing a live, right? Sue Johnson's going to watch this. 90 people are in the next room. Let's go get that emotion and and. If you over push to that, you actually increase the protection. So my lives went to a whole different level when I really learned to do the, all the things we talk about, okay, focus, but, but in particular, camp out mm-hmm. right at the edge of their pain. Mm. Really spend time with my full presence, with my validation, with my reflection, priming the longings, finding the vivid trigger, and letting the, letting the emotions come in the room organically. When I started doing that, uh, my lives went up to a completely different level. So I think that's probably something that, that we're talking about today and that everyone might consider. The ability to really, really camp out right next to their pain and let them choose to bring that forward is really, really key. But that is very unnatural because it doesn't flow with the story. It doesn't flow to the next thing. To camp out right next to pain or right in the edge of the pain is something you have to be trained to do for most of us. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick commercial break and we'll come back and we'll get practical about what does that look like on how to practically really camp out near your client's pain. If you like the content of this podcast and you want more specificity and ability to see it, a team of EFT trainers, supervisors, and therapists Work together at successandvulnerability.com to create a focused online training program to help you learn how to work in some of the hardest places in emotional and relational distress. Check us out at successandvulnerability.com. All right. So we've kind of given you a frame for why. And here's why I think that's important. That's the first point I'm going to make on about camping out near fear and pain. We need to give, be able to give our clients good reasons about why we're staying at a place. And 
So be explicit. That's my first point I would make. Be explicit and be clear. And this is where you can. We've had an episode on even psych ed. Hey, you know, what I'm seeing for you two is other more times than not in your relationship, you do pretty good at some things. But it's what I notice is when kind of something hurts or something goes out or something kind of touches a place that kind of, you know, promotes a little kind of anxiety or fear. That's where your relationship falls apart. And what I want to be able to do is to kind of help you to access the good parts of you in that moment. So that's why we got to stay here. That's where your relationship falls apart. And I think that's where we can get the most done. And so that's, you know, I'm being explicit and being clear with them about why I'm picking a particular place. I like that, James, a lot. That's that's not what I was going to say. Uh, so that's helping me right there. Um, I, I do notice myself doing that more often when things are really difficult. Mm. Um, but I think it's r- probably pretty healthy on a regular basis. And we're talking about 15 seconds, you know, 20 seconds, that's 30 right. seconds, not three minutes. Mm-mm. But 15 seconds on here's what I'm going to do next as, as your therapist and maybe just a touch of why. Yep. I need to understand so that I can get clear and maybe get more clear for the relationship the types of pain that happen for you in this place that don't get talked about at home. Mm-hmm. So here's my question. Boom. So that helps kind of bring people along, show your work. I think that creates safety. 100%. So that's being explicit and being clear. Then I think this links to the podcast episode we did on the fray. For me, I want to get into the fray. I don't. I want to talk about in those moments when the fear and the pain hits you. And maybe you have certain moves you try to do with the fear and the pain, but those moves don't work. What happens in that moment? Or you see your client, your partner's fear, you see their pain come alive, and you find some way that you try to be there for them or show them that you care. But even in your best attempts, it doesn't seem like it works. Can I get root? That's where I want to slow down and get clear. So I want to get into the fray as much as, as like Ryan is talking about, approximately, you know, in their safety zone. Here's a line I just heard from uh, Leanne Campbell. You've heard her on the podcast before. Uh, Leanne sa- keeps saying, like, I want to respect their window of tolerance while continuing to push their um, their edge of experience. So she's watching both just what Ryan was saying. I want to I want to watch their window of tolerance, but I'm also watching to push their edge of experience. So when if, if I'm going back to the image, we keep moving the camp closer to their fear and pain. We might be on the edge, but depending, you know, as we go, we want to get into we want to be working our way closer to it. All right. So I think it's the question that you asked to help to kind of assess and get clear to what happens to it. Then this is another George one right here. And even when you get access to the emotional experience, don't just automatically keep trying to deepen and heighten it. Make sure you try and understand it. Truly understand what is this fear or this pain? What is it saying? What's the meaning of it? Truly try to build it out. What's the function of the emotion? Yeah. 100. And in the context of this relationship, that's where the trigger comes in as well, too. Like, what does it mean? What does it tell you about, like, you know, like what's coming for you or what might happen if you can't figure this out? Really try and get the meaning. And then my move off of that one. You want to? I was just going to say, if you want an emotion to move to a healthier space, however you want to define that, let it achieve its function. Mm. Every emotion is functional. They are they are physiological processes, just like every other physiological process mm-hmm. we have going on. We have a heart beating right now, and my lungs are breathing, even if I'm not telling them to, and they are doing their job, and emotions are no different. So if you want an emotion to slow down, to be more organized, to be more vulnerable, you have to let it, you have to work with its function that it's trying to do before that happens. And that's a good way to camp out near it. And that's not even you having to like try and push for more. Like, so tell me your worst cat, like that's in that place of this goes back to, I think in the episode we talked about, Ryan talked about the full catch. If someone talks about their fear and their pain, don't move to the next question. Slow down, really understand it, fully take it in. Man, for me, I love reflection. That's my go-to move. Man, I see this thing come across your face even right now. As you say that, I just see that that pain hits you and you just look down at the floor. So can I slow down here with you? And I want to understand what is that pain is even saying as I see it wash across your face right here, right now. Like, you know, what's the function of that pain? What is that pain trying to maybe tell you or warn you about here? What is it saying about you? You know, that kind of, that's my kind of way. Fully catch it is my way. So then, so I want to get the meaning and the function of it. My next move to kind of camp out near the pain 
is in even as they talk about that function and meaning, guess what that does usually? It provokes a live experience right there in your room. This is where it may transition from you talking about something that happened previously in the week or the fight that, that happened in the parking lot before the came in session to my question usually off that is going to be like, and what's it like even right now as we kind of look at that place, as you talk about it and you even tell me that meaning, what does it bring alive in you right here, right now? Yeah. All, all that reflecting and validating that we're doing that working with secondary emotion, it is really important, but it, it's not the answer. Mm-mm. We're doing that to open the door. So you don't want to get focused on the door too much. Mm -hmm. You want to get into the room. That's right. Get into the place, emotional space for that. And so bringing it alive in the room is absolutely essential. 100. And then, Brian, my next one off that is going to be, even if I do that kind of, that's an evocative question, give a good validation. That makes so much sense. And when I look at this and I see that same thing that your eyes see, or I hear that tone that your ears hear, this pain hits you because it has this big message that right here is the place where everything could fall apart if we don't come up with a solution right here. And even as you talk about it right now, you feel this anxiety come up in your chest. I really love that part of you, that your body is so attuned to the nature of this relationship because this is your person. This This is your safe place. And right now, it feels like there's something kind of threatening the bond between the two of you and your body is so brilliant at picking up on that. Man, thank you for letting me see that come alive even in this room right here, right now. You want to give a validation, and we're just sitting with it, helping them have a new positive experience in a sense with it, right? And that's that's mine. You have anything else there, Ryan? You can go ahead. Okay. And then after I give that validation, then I got to think to myself, now this is camping out. This is maybe I need to do another rep of that again. So let me make sure I go back to the top again. Then I'll run the trigger back past them. And then I'll even, and then now we got it live in the in the room, and 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 you, so even now as you you kind of I talk about that pain or that, this is where I'm stealing from like I've seen George do it, I've seen Lee, I've seen several of them do it. Can you kind of help me see what your eyes see? Like when you're in this moment, and you're with this fear. Like what is it even your body kind of begins to pick up on right now that provokes that anxiety in you? Because now it could, it could switch to. I remember this happened to me at a live in North Carolina. Uh, I'm not quite sure how she's going to take me. I'm not sure if I'm going to be a burden right now. Even saying it right now, like I feel the, the, the client was like, I feel this nervousness come up in my throat because I'm not quite sure if this is going to be a burden. Too much. It's going to be too much for her. And he's constantly looking in her eyes to see if any moment, if this is, if his pain talking about it is going to overwhelm his partner. Right? So you could keep doing rounds of assembly in that kind of, I say assembly, I want to be, it's kind of assembly with a deepening tone. And by the way, part of why you camp out in your pain, I'm, I hope I'm modeling it somewhat, is through your tone and through your pace. That's a way, a form of containment. And also running it through you as a therapist is another great tool to use here. Man, I see this place. I'm feeling it now. It hits me in my gut. Oof. Or what Ryan calls the uh, attachment pain sounds. <laughs> Those big man, Ryan. Those are huge. Those deep breaths, like wow. Whew. Okay, yeah, my body gets it. My body sees it. Whew. Let me slow myself down, man. Gosh, even as this pain hits me, yeah, I can feel that kind of come up in my throat too. And the whole objective is here. We're trying to get it to a point where Sue would say, "You got to get it hot. You got to get it cooking." Because when you've done that, I think for me, me and Ryan try never to prescribe numbers. But there is a part where you think you've stayed long enough, stay a little bit longer sometimes, depending on what stage of therapy you're in. I want to see if I could do three to five rounds for me of that kind of deepening assembly where I'm letting it wash over me and resonate with the client. And then I'm trying to work myself to a place where where it's a place where we can get them to do something that's new, different, or deeper with this emotion. Oh, That's what's kind of coming for me. What are you thinking, Ryan? Yeah, I think that's good. I think um, qualifier. Mm -hmm. If you were trying to come up with a reason not to hang out on the edge of pain, so in other words, if you're making an argument to go ahead and push into it, the biggest argument is if you hang out on the edge of pain, you're going to get blocks and exits. Mm. I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. As As long as you recognize what just happened, 
and and you have a move to sort of counter that that exit. But you do have to contain. Yep. So if if you're like, I don't want to work with blocks, first of all, I'm like, I don't know how that's gonna work. But if if you know, there are some people who who in some of their cases can just push into that primary emotion. And once it's alive in the room, you got it. Yeah. But most of the time, if you're trying to push too prematurely, you're out of attunement. You're going to get more protection. So you're better off, I think, to attune right to the edge of where they are and let that emotion come up organically. But it is required then to be ready to contain exits and blocks and protection. Mm. Otherwise, that's not a good move. I like that, Ryan. Um, and I guess let me be clear about when I say I like that. Camping out near the edge and all those things I'm doing – as I'm doing that and I'm running those reflections, I'm trying to go off of what I'm seeing happen. So I just keep I'm I'm willing to I'm willing to circle around and let it come alive and trust the process. Me and Ryan were just talking about that for a training coming up and trusting that. But also, as I'm doing that, I'm going around. Ryan is right. They're going to come up with a new story, or they're going to kind of maybe they might go into an elongated story. You begin to feel them exit out of it. And so camping out is just being able to make sure you as a therapist keep your focus. You be able to remember, remember, hey, hold on a second. We were just in some pain and fear. Why are we talking about the latest funny you know, story about this other thing? Or, you know, or I, I start talking to one client about her fear and she starts talking about things in her partner. And then I just give a quick validation. Like, I really appreciate this part about you. Kind of we touch this pain. And you kind of you you start looking over at your partner because there's a part I think you're trying to get me to see what activates the fear and the pain for you. And I really appreciate that you can do it. Thank you for pointing that out. I want to make sure I catch that. But can I catch even as you look over there, like what happens and you kind of point that out? What is it? Does it touch? Is this touching that fear and that pain again? And that's me still trying to kind of camp out near it and not go into because that could have easily exited me out to a conversation about it could have shifted my focus over to the partner to talk to them about that thing that the their their that their partner just pointed out we could start a whole nother assembly off a new trigger but what i'm really knowing is hey we're camping out near fear and pain and this makes sense with what this what just happened right here you got anything i do Go i ahead. do you know i, I do. saw you writing <laughs> james makes fun of me all the time justifiably so <laughs> my, my brain cannot help but organize things. I don't know. I need to see it there. It's a, it's a survival trait and a gift, though. There you go. There you go. So I got a question. Mm-hmm. Um, I got a request uh, or two requests. I've okay. got, I'm sorry, not a request. I said the wrong word. Let me start that over. Okay. Forget that. I got four things. I got a question. I got two requirements hmm. to do this well. I got a process and I got a vision. All right, so same things we're saying over and over, just slightly different shades of the same comments here. But the question is, can you really trust that attachment's going to work? Okay? Because if you can't trust that attachment's there, that attachment's going to work. And by work, what I mean is that the longings are there and the the vulnerable pain is there. And if you can find a way to contain the space, create safety with your attunement, that it's going to come forward. If you can't trust that, you're going to do something else. Mm. That's okay. That's okay. I'm not saying the other things you do are bad, but you're not going to do EFT. I can promise you that. Not well, at least. So you have to trust it. And that's hard to do if you don't have corrective experience in your body. So part of what teaches you to be a good therapist is failure. And part of what teaches you to be a good therapist is success. The really good therapists are the ones that can balance both of those. Failures learn you, they teach you things. But your body also needs a little bit of win to go, oh, okay, it really is there. That person who's fuming at minute 18 can be in big tears in minute 42. And we have the map that just helps them access what they already want to do. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the question. The the two requirements for me to, to... Access great depth, pick a word, heightening, deepening, expanding emotion, Um, the juice, going for the juice is what Leanne calls it, uh, are two things that cannot be replaced, you and time. Hmm. It it doesn't matter, at least in my experience and understanding, who you are, what culture you come from, what culture you're even working with, all those things are really important. 
but you can't replace this. It has to be uniquely you, and you have to take time. And it's usually going to take more time than you think it should. Those are the two that you just can't leave home without. And so by you, what I mean is, what is the most resourceful, nurturing version of you? I have a few people at trainings who said, I don't really have that. I don't do that. I'm just more, you know, cognitive. And some people are like, well, you shouldn't do EFT then. I would just say, yeah, you do. Yeah, you ever had someone in your family die? You ever had a, a, a friend who dies and you show up at, you know, an emergency room around a death or in a, in a funeral home? You, tell me how you talk. What does your voice sound like? It, at, to a person, they all go, oh, yeah, yeah, I do. Like, yeah, it's impossible not to. There's Even though some of us are better than others, when you see incredible vulnerability, it demands a different kind of engagement. At the time that we were recording this, there was a, a really big um, injury in the NFL to a player, and it was stunning to watch the next 10 minutes of what happened in the stadium. The broadcasters all were crying. The commentators were crying. They canceled the game. And, and it's, it's because there's this exposure to incredible vulnerability, mm-hmm. and in this case, the potential of a death. And in, in some ways, I know it sounds funny to say this, we're trying to recreate that in our office because that different level of being together is the corrective experience. So the process, you know, it's funny. Um, I, I had someone help me with this, so um, thank you. <laughs> um, they they watched me do, I think, three lives, and they said, hey, you're doing that different than you're teaching it. And I'm like, am I? I didn't even know I was doing it. So here's a good rule of thumb. If something you're doing is really effective and you don't know you're doing it, it's really good for you as a clinician. Because what that means is your attunement is driving your next move. And if you establish your focus, then your own attunement driving your next move is ideal because your attachment system creates attachment. By the way, if you're a supervisor or a trainer, it's not good news. If you're a supervisor or a trainer and you're like, I don't know why I did that. Mm. Well, the answer is we'll figure it out <laughs> because, because all you just told your supervisees is, well, just be talented like me. And that's not good enough. So I want to challenge that. I'm speaking that to me primarily more that's than anybody good. else that I've, I've got to push to get more clear. And sometimes people help you. So the process I'm talking about is that's good. nothing different than we've saw, talked about before. But what I was doing in the live to draw this person out, to hang around right on the edge of their emotion and just sort of wait for the eruption to happen is I would start with a a positive intent, a longing, right to the vivid somatic trigger and then to what that means from an attachment lens. And I would do those three over and over and over. Like I think I did it nine times in a row in a session and, and at that point, a big eruption happens. And now we're just finishing the mission, and it's tons of fun, honestly. But that's the hard part of that work. But that, that kind of order, you don't have to do it that exact way. There's a way to think about it. Positive intention and longing. What I really want is to know that we're on the same team. What I really want is there to be peace between us until you see your partner roll their eyes over to the left, and instantly it sends you the message that you don't matter, right? And so to stay there, instead of trying to solve that or move that, to stay there, it's really, really hard for people's bodies not to have an an upregulation moment. You want to say something to that, James? You look, you do. Well, I like those good practical ones. Those are big. If you're hanging out near fear or pain, you don't want to drown your client in. We think we've said that. We want this to be safe. And I love that, being able to use some longing and the positivity a little bit too, right? Mm -hmm. And some form of validation. Man, this makes so much sense. Like I, when I'm particularly, because I, I, I just had that live with the withdrawal hanging out near their fear of pain. Man, I think so much. You're really helping me see this. You're really, really helping me get this. You're doing a good job with your words. I appreciate it. Thank you for allowing me to be witness with you to this moment and to this experience, man. I use a lot of that positivity and validation. But that's just to give them a breather. And we're going to kind of drop back and go back towards looking at that again. We're not going to exit out. Yeah, so I thought that was good. It's good. And we talk about repetition a good bit on here. Mm-hmm. And good therapy is very repetitive. You do less and you do it better. And, and that's an ongoing process. You yes. know, so we talked about repetitively reflecting the attachment dilemma. That's if we're 50 miles away from their vulnerable pain. Mm. 
But the repetition is also key there. Reflecting their dilemma, running temp and assembly over and over and over, trying to reorganize. Like we said before, a lot of reactivity is your client saying, I desperately need you to reorganize this. Well, I don't even know what to do here. As you get closer to that pain, you, you can start to drop off pieces of the assembly. You don't need as much action tendency time. And so resetting that positive intent opens doors. Mm -hmm. And then the trigger really opens doors and the attachment meaning and, and to experience the client experiencing the therapist repetitively reflecting those elements. It makes it hard for vulnerable emotion not to come forward. If, if you right. could stop your trigger, you wouldn't be in my office. That's right. So we're trying to use it for good. Last piece for me is just the, the big picture vision, which is so basic we miss it. Um, and it's, but it's, it's really all we're doing in EFT. If you've been to any of our trainings in the last two years, we, we tell the little Jimmy story. Have we done a little Jimmy story on here? Maybe we have to have a little Jimmy podcast. <laughs> I think we have. I think we have. Yeah, we'll get he little Jimmy on. He usually gets hurt on the playground. We'll get little Jimmy on next week. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So w what we just say is if we, you know, wherever I'm training or you're training, we just say, all right, where, where is the closest elementary school? I think we've said this before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we'll say it quickly. And, uh, you know, little Jimmy, you know, four-year-old, five-year-old, three-year-old falls down and cuts himself pretty good. And, and caretaker is over sitting on a bench watching them play. And, and little Jimmy and the caretaker's dance is everything you need to know about attachment. So, you know, and, and kids tend to be better at this, honestly, than adults. And they also get a lot more love, by the way. And that's not a, co that's not a coincidence. So little Jimmy turns and cries, and his nonverbals and maybe verbals, although nonverbal is more important, says, I'm vulnerable. I don't have this. I'm in pain. Can you come be a part of the solution? Right? And the caretaker, because that vulnerability is so clean and clear, the signal is so clear, the caretaker, nat their body naturally moves into attunement into that level. This is why we deepen. Yep. Because if little Jimmy says, this is your fault, why weren't you here? Then it's a whole different dance. Yep. And that's what our clients come in with. They're really stuck in blame. And we're trying to have a different kind of conversation. And deepening emotion is how you get a clear signal out to the comforting responder. Exactly. And I love that's another good reason why we do what we do. Because camping out near fear or pain has a higher likelihood of success of evoking empathy or comfort or support versus the protective moves or blaming or kind of avoidance. And um, it does. I remember just once again, I will quote like the live I did in North Carolina. I could see it. The pursuer was blocked at the beginning and struggling and was really coaching the withdrawer. But the more the withdrawer's pain and fear started coming alive in the experience, her face, even the attendees were like, James, when you were working with him, her face kept turning like red, but it wasn't like she was angry. Her eyes softened. She was witnessing. She was watching her partner get into this vulnerable. And she's like, oh, my gosh, I'm, I want to be there. I want." It. But it's because we camped out near his fear or pain. And that's why we're trying to share this episode with you is to really be willing to, like as Ryan said, camp out near the edges of it and trust that you don't have to force it or make it happen. When you make the conditions right, and I'm not saying every time, but our clients can feel safety and they'll feel that and they see that you want to understand that it's getting organized and they will start letting that and they, all of a sudden that kind of like talking on the experiencing scale. You hear more about that on the Catherine Ream episode as well. They'll start talking about it present moment. They'll kind of push that window, the envelope. So really appreciate and hope for you. And I think a good takeaway is how are you though? How are you at camping out near fear and pain? What does it do to your own body as a therapist? You know, where do you find yourself exit the process? Like kind of like, oh, gosh, this ain't working. Let's bring in the tents, get the horses. We're, run, we're running this. I'm going old Western camping here, right? Catch that. But no, seriously, just hope for you, you know, how do you camp out with your clients near their fear and pain? Because that's where they need us to help push our leading edge as well. But we also need to help them be able to push their leading edge also. Thank you for listening. We hope this experience helps you push the leading edge in your work to help people connect with themselves and with each other. Please subscribe to our podcast and leave us a five-star review. You can contact us at pushtheleadingedge at gmail.com 
And you can follow us on our Facebook page at Push the Leading Edge. You can follow Ryan on Facebook at Ryan Rayner Professional Training and on his website, RyanRaynerTraining.com. You can follow James on Facebook and Instagram at DocHawkLPC. You can also check out his website, DocHawkLPC.com. Thank you.